And go ahead and have your seats. And as you're getting settled in, grab a Bible or your Bible app. Open up to the book of Proverbs, chapter 14. It's where we're going to be at this morning as we continue in this series of Proverbs called How Not to Be an Idiot. And we're going to be continuing in that this morning. So Proverbs, chapter 14. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love for you to take one of the Bibles that you'll find under the chairs in front of you. Take it home. Make that yours uh, because we want you to, to know the Word and study it at your home so that it can change your life. Now, my name is Robert. I'm the youth pastor here for maybe some of you who don't know me. And a little bit about me, I've got a son that's a year and a half old. His name is Eli. And one of the amazing things I've learned over the last year and a half of being a parent is that you get to experience every moment of your child's life at this phase. And, and, and some of you uh, maybe are in that phase right now, some of you are, are recent, or maybe you're redoing it in the grandparent phase. But see, when they're young like this, you get to experience everything that they experience, every moment, every good thing, all the excitement, all the joy, all the memories that are made, all the discoveries, but you also get the bad with it, including every single temper tantrum that exists. And see, the funny thing about temper tantrums is that they get into those because they want a a certain end result. That temper tantrum happens because they want something and they think that's how they're going to get there. But the hilarious thing for us watching it is that it almost guarantees they're not going to get what they want. You know, when my son throws a temper tantrum because he wants a certain snack or he wants to go play in the kiddie pool at 9.30 at night on the patio, it almost guarantees it's not going to happen. And see, it never leads them to the solution that they want. And, and we got to see this play out in a humorous way uh, several weeks ago. Um, I enjoy photography. I've got a nice camera that I love to take pictures of the landscapes with. And, and Eli always sees me taking pictures with my camera, and so he wanted to play with it. Well, that's not going to happen. So we, we dug around. We found an old digital camera from, you know, 10 years or so ago. So it's essentially useless to us at this point. Uh, And so we put some batteries in it. It still works, still fired up. And so we're like, go for it, kid. Have fun. And so for weeks, he'd run around the house. He'd pick it up and he'd smack it against his face. And he'd like squeeze it real tight to make it go off. And he loved learning about this camera. He loved finding what all the buttons did and things like that. And then one day, he made this amazing discovery that underneath there's a secret compartment And inside it were the batteries, and if you opened it, they came out, and then that's the only thing the camera did. Once he found that, that was his sole obsession, was taking the batteries out and then trying to put them back in. But see, he's a year and a half old, so his hand-eye coordination is that of a year and a half year old. It's not very good, and so he'd get frustrated with it, trying to get them back in, trying to get the camera back on. And so we'd see it, and we'd help him, and one day he refused to let us help him. And he, he'd, you know, grunt at the camera and it wouldn't work and we'd try and help him and he'd push us away and he'd just set on doing it himself. And we're watching him and he kind of took this moment and paused and it was like, if you could read his mind, he's probably like, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. He's just like pausing, like looking at it and then he picks up the batteries, he tries again, doesn't work and he grabs the camera, he pulls it back and he chucks it across the kitchen floor and it goes tumbling across the tile and it stays in one piece but... It didn't survive. The camera never turned back on. It never came back to life, which is another source of frustration for him now that it doesn't turn on. But see, that temper tantrum that he he threw, that he was engaged in, it didn't end the way he wanted it to. But this is really normal for toddlers. It's normal for them to just be overcome with their emotions, overcome with their anger or their joy or their sadness and letting emotions completely drive their life, and especially letting anger take over and drive the moments of their life. But see, this morning, my observation is that we're a lot more like toddlers than we may like to admit. We're a lot more like a toddler than sometimes we want to admit to ourselves. Because while we may not be throwing our electronics across the kitchen, or maybe we are, I don't know what happens in your house. I don't know what goes on there. And I'm, I think I'm safe to assume that we're not kicking and screaming on the floor of Walmart when we can't get what we want. But see, when things don't go our way, I think that just like toddlers, we want to let anger take over. We want our response to be driven by our anger, our frustration, our hurt, whatever it may be. And see, the truth is that, that anger is something that we all deal with. 
And as we've been looking through the book of Proverbs these last several weeks, we've seen how Proverbs gives us these two roads, these two paths in life. As his father's writing to his son on how to be a man, how to have a life that's successful, he gives us all these ways that you can be wise or be foolish. And we've seen this in marriage and in parenting and last week in pride. And today we're going to be unpacking what Proverbs tells us about anger. And I know just at me saying that, some of you are going, oh, joy. Why didn't I sleep in longer this morning? But I think that this is something that's super important for us. And while it may not be the most comfortable topic, it may not be the most exciting thing to think about, the truth is this is something that applies to all of us. Because whether we have anger as a, a primary sin struggle in our life or we just have it as something that happens in the, the gaps uh, of our moments and our days, anger is something that we all deal with. And so Proverbs 14, 29 is what we're going to be looking at this morning. And it continues this trend of showing us these two options of life. And Proverbs 14, 29 says this. It says, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. See, this passage has this clear separation, these two options, and it shows us so bluntly, so boldly at the beginning that the road to foolishness in life is anger. If we want to travel down the road to foolishness, all we have to do is live in anger. And see, the book of Proverbs kind of has this as an overarching theme when it's talking about anger. And in preparation for this, I tried to find every proverb that had anything to do with anger or temper or impatience, and I kind of put them all together, and I thought, what is the common theme here? What does this man want to tell his son about anger? And the overarching theme is that anger is foolish. But see, this isn't a brand new idea. None of you are like, wow, I hadn't thought about that. I never realized that anger was foolish. We get that. We get that anger is foolish. We're never putting it down as a quality character trait. If you're filling out a a character reference for a friend and they're like, what are their strengths and weaknesses? You don't put in the strengths column constantly angry (laughs) because unless they're applying to be an Avenger, that's not a quality character trait. We get that anger is foolish, and yet anger still exists in our life. We still respond to poor situations in anger and in frustration and impatience. And so this morning, even if you are not the person with the violent outbursts, the violent tendencies, this is still something that applies to you. Because this is something that applies to me. Two months ago when Pastor Chad put this schedule together and said, okay, this is what you're going to be teaching on and you're going to have the the topic of anger and patience in the book of Proverbs. And I thought, and and then I actually said it out loud, I said, well, this is going to be interesting because anger isn't something I struggle with. And I said it out loud because I'm young and dumb and I speak without thinking sometimes. (laughs) And so, you know, we had some conversation about that and and then over the, the last couple months, I've been reading through Proverbs and, and praying about what God's Word tells us about anger. And God's been super faithful to show me every single situation that I've responded to with impatience or anger or frustration. Because the truth is that all of us have that temptation. All of us have that tendency in some area of our life to respond to life in anger And Proverbs shows us some big ways that anger leads us to foolishness, some big reasons why anger doesn't lead us to a good place in life. And the first is is simply that anger does not help the situation. Anger does not help the situation. And no situation in life does responding in anger actually lead us to a solution that we want. In no way does responding in impatience and anger actually help our problems, it simply adds more problems. And it demonstrates this. Proverbs 15.1 says this. It says, a soft word turns wrath away, but a harsh word stirs up anger. It uses this illustration that when we're having disagreements, when we are having arguments with people, that gentle, soft response is what ends it. It's what solves the problem. But when we respond with anger, it simply adds more anger. And so anger never leads us to solutions for our problems, but only adds more problems. And I was thinking about this in terms of driving, because driving is something we do all the time. We drive every day. We encounter the good things, the bad things when driving. 
I think driving is one of those places where the, the kind, soft-spoken, gentle person that we all want to be can be transformed into a different version of us that's unrecognizable when we're in traffic. I think we've all had those moments where we're, we're sitting there, we're contemplating in our mind, is it worth the ticket or the insurance claim to just push this person off the road? Is it worth it? We've all had those moments. But see, I know that when I respond in anger or impatience or frustration when driving, I you know for a fact it doesn't change the driving habits of anyone else. If I'm impatient because someone's driving slow and I begin to express that in a variety of ways, the only thing that's going to happen is a person's probably going to get drive slower to spite my impatience. Because anger never leads us to solutions for our problems. It only adds more problems. So this morning, think with me. How might anger be adding to the problems of your life? How might impatience be adding to this, the issues of your situations, adding to the complexity of life? Because anger never leads us to a solution that we desire. Second way that anger pulls us into foolishness is because anger damages our relationships. Anger damages the relationships that exist in our life. And this is a huge one, and it's not one that we can immediately see, but something that happens over the long haul of our life. See, Proverbs 14, 17 says this. It says, a man of quick temper acts foolishly, and a man of evil devices is hated. Notice the legacy that it has there. Notice the legacy that's left for this person a legacy of foolishness and hatred. And so we need to consider how our actions, how our thoughts, how our words, how our responses are going to affect the relationships that exist in our life. How are your words and your actions and your responses towards your spouse, how is that going to impact your marriage 15 years from now? When you think about your interaction with your kids or your extended family, how are your responses today going to impact the relationship they want with you 10 years from now? And it extends out from there. How is your interaction with your coworkers or your boss or your employees, how is that going to impact the legacy of relationships you have? If you're at a restaurant and you get your order that's not anything like what you ordered, do the people around you brace for impact for the server or do they expect you to respond with patience and understanding over the mistake. See, all these things add up to the legacy that we'll leave with our life. Is it gonna be one of patience or one of anger? Because the truth is that anger is the direct enemy of quality relationships. When we respond with anger and impatience towards the people that we love and care about, it erodes the foundations of those relationships. Finally, Proverbs shows us the anger leads us to foolishness simply because anger shows our lack of self-control. Proverbs 29, 11 says this. It says, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. I love this passage because it, it kind of captures the emotion of our anger. It says the fool gives full vent to his spirit. You know, you picture that like unleashing every aspect of anger that you have on the people around you. We get full vent. A fool does that. But a wise man quietly holds it back. See, wisdom is us learning to have self-control over our emotions, over our responses, over our desire to sin. And, and we see this clearly in children who lack the self-control. They have temper tantrums because they lack the self-control over their emotions and their actions. The only reason the story of, of my son and this camera exists is because he lacked self-control. He was overcome with the anger and the frustration and so the camera took a flight across the room because of the lack of self-control. But see, God desires for us to live lives that are self-controlled so that they would honor him. In the book of Galatians chapter 5, we're given a list of nine character traits that God wants each and every one of his followers to live out. And these nine character traits are called the fruit of the Spirit because they're the fruit of the Holy Spirit working in us. It's the only way we can attain these things is God working through us and changing our life. And you look through these nine things and they're, they're summarized and closed with the final character trait that's self-control. 
And see, God wants us to live lives of self-control so that when we're tempted to sin, we choose his path instead. We're tempted to travel down that road to foolishness that we choose God's wisdom instead. Because self-control is about a lot more than what happens in the buffet line. Self-control is about what happens in our hearts when we're tempted to sin. See, God desires all of us to live lives that reflect the character of his son Jesus to the world around us. That requires us growing in self-control and growing in our relationship with him because whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. This passage gives us the, the options available to us, the path to foolishness, but then it shows us that the path to wisdom is patience. The path to wisdom and life is patience. And we could unpack a lot of what that means and the practical applications of it, but as I began to think through that statement, I made a mental list of people in my life that I said, they are wise people. Not that they're just smart or that they're experts in certain areas, that overall they live a life of wisdom. And I encourage you to to even make a list of that right now. Think about the people in your life that you would say are wise. I started to think through family members and then went out to employers and leaders, pastors, mentors, people that have been in my life, and I said, they're wise people. And once I had that list, I started to think, which of those people are patient? I started to go down, and every single person on that list, I said, they are wise people, also had patience as a virtue that when I've seen them through difficult situations, they've been patient and understanding, because patience and wisdom are tied together. And if we want a perfect example of this, it's in the life of Jesus Christ. See, in every trying moment he faced, he was patient. When he was dealing with his disciples and they were foolish or self-centered or arrogant, he was patient. As he was dealing with the religious leaders who contradicted him and doubted him and tried to trap him in situations, he was patient. As he dealt with people questioning his teaching, people questioning how he helped and healed people, he was patient. And ultimately, in the final hours of his life, as he was falsely accused, as he was condemned to death and nailed to a cross, people stood by mocking him, condemning him, criticizing him. Instead of responding in just anger, in just condemnation, he was patient And he even paused to pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And see, even today, he is patient with us. He sees us live lives where we're repeating mistakes. He sees us choose foolishness over wisdom. He sees us choose our path instead of his path, and he is patient with us. He is patient, and he doesn't give us the judgment, the condemnation we deserve, but instead, He gives us the blessings, the goodness that we could never earn. And so if we want to live on this path to wisdom, it requires patience. And so here's a few ways that we can begin to live that out. A few steps along that road, if you will. And the first is to know where you struggle. If we want to be patient, if we want to be people who respond in patience, it requires us knowing where that struggle begins. Because for all of us, there's some area of our life that causes us to become angry, that causes us to lose patience, that causes us to respond in harshness or bitterness. And so we need to think through what areas of our life cause that. Where does it start for us? So think with, with me in your marriage. What are the conversations? What are the talking points that when they come up, it's an instant argument? What are those points of your marriage where there's tension, there's frustration and anger that exist? What, what, what aspects, what events that happen in your family cause you to lose patience? What are the things that when your kids do that certain thing, you're guaranteed to respond in anger? Think about your workplace. What are the events, what are the things that happen that if that takes place, the day's ruined for you and everyone else? Because, see, we need to identify the things that cause us to be angry so that we can change those patterns of living. And it's not just the, the external things. It can also be the things that are about where we're at in life. 
You know, Snickers caught on to something great with the whole hangry thing and how we're transformed into a different version of us when we're hungry. And they've sold, uh, you know, who knows how many candy bars off that, that advertising campaign, but it's true. Hunger can be a genuine source of anger for some people. And if that's you, you can know that, you can plan around that, you can, you can accommodate yourself. But other things are common, tiredness, stress, overwhelmed from a busy schedule, all those things can be a trigger point for your anger. So know where you struggle, know where that starts so that in advance you can choose how you will respond. So when that situation comes, when that conversation comes up, when that topic arises, you can say, I'm not going to respond how I normally do. I'm going to respond with patience and, and understanding and grace. So know where you struggle. But the second thing that, that helps us along to this road to patience is to live out kindness. See, we've already touched on the fruit of the Spirit a little bit, how the final fruit in that list is self-control. But right in the middle, number five of that list of nine character traits that God wants all of us to live out is kindness. Kindness is the antithesis, it's the antidote, it's the opposite of anger. But see, I think kindness is minimized in our minds. We think that kindness sometimes is just holding doors open and saying nice things and sending thank you cards. And for those of you that graduated on Thursday, high school students, or send thank you cards. It's a good thing to do. But kindness is much more than holding doors open and sending thank you cards. Because when God said that the fruit of the Spirit includes kindness, I know for a fact he had more in mind than just holding open a door for people. Because kindness is about how we treat people, not just what we do for them. And specifically, kindness is about how we treat the people that make our life difficult. If we're going to use the, the language of this series, kindness is about how we treat the idiots of the world. See, if we want to live as people who are patient, people who are wise, we need to be kind to people. We need to treat them with kindness. But oftentimes we miss the opportunities to do this because we're focused on us. I know that when I've missed opportunities to be kind, it's because I'm focused on my situation and what I'm dealing with and what I'm frustrated about and what I'm going through. But see, if we want to see opportunities to be kind and patient with people, all it takes is trading shoes with them. Just for a moment thinking, what are they going through? What are they dealing with? What are they frustrated about? What hurts do they have in their life? And see, I got this, this lesson very bluntly from, from God a few months ago. Being a youth pastor, you get the opportunity to deal with a lot of teenagers, which means you get an opportunity to deal with a lot of people who, let's just say, give you opportunities to be patient. And, and for the course of several weeks, there were three or four students that every week, one of them would just find some way to annoy me, some way to just frustrate me to the point that when the end of the night came, I could not wait for them to get picked up. And, and I wish I could take credit for how this happened, but it was definitely God, just one of those two by four to the back of the head moments, because every week a certain kid would just frustrate me to no end, and then outside, after the event finished, we'd be talking, just having small talk, and they would just dump their life story on me. They would just sit there and just kind of like drop every hurt, every pain they were dealing with, every difficult situation they had in their life. And in that moment, I was crushed, not just because of the hurt that they were walking around with and trying to deal with, but because I had been unkind and impatient with them when they are struggling with more than I could have even imagined. And so if we want to be people who are patient, we need to be kind. If we want to live out kindness, it takes trading shoes and just understanding what are the other people going through? What are they dealing with in life? Finally, if we want to be people who are wise and patient, most importantly, we need to walk with God. This is the most important thing of this whole idea of how to walk in wisdom, how to walk with patience. Because ultimately, if we want to overcome anger or any other sin struggle in our life, we can't do that on our own. If we want to move past this and be transformed and be made into a new person, we need a relationship with Jesus and his life-changing power in us. Because we can't do this on our own. 
We can't grow in the fruit of the Spirit on our own. It requires God working in us, God working through us and changing our minds, changing our actions and our behaviors. But that requires us allowing him to work in us. It takes us saying, I'm going to allow God to change the patterns of my life. I'm going to give my life over to him. Every action, every thought, every word, every response that I have, I'm going to allow him to change it so it can be more honoring to him. And so today, if you're sitting here struggling with anger in a big way or a small way, know that that God wants to work in your life. And the only way you can overcome that is by allowing him to work in you and through you. Because God's goal for your life is for you to have the character of Jesus, for you to live in a way that that character is displayed to the world around you. But that only happens when we trust God and follow him. And ultimately, as we talk about this, this idea of anger, it's not about anger management. It's not about finding a 10-step or a three-step or a two-step process to overcome anger. It's about trusting God to develop the fruit of the Spirit in you and allowing him to work in your life and change you. See, Proverbs gives us these options for our life, the destination that we take our road down. So today, my question for you is, what will be your destination What will be the legacy you leave with your life? Is it going to be one of foolishness or wisdom? One of patience or anger? Because as we walk down the road to wisdom, God will start to change our life. If we follow God's path of wisdom, he'll start to transform us. So we've talked about these areas of our life that are affected by this. So think with me. How would your marriage change if you were a person of patience and understanding? That when those hot topics came up, you didn't respond with frustration and anger, but with patience and love. How would your family dynamic change if when things didn't go well with your children or extended family, that that you responded with grace and forgiveness and patience? How would your relationships outside of the house change if when things didn't go well at work, when things all fell apart on a work day, you responded with kindness and love and patience to the people around you because the truth is that God's wisdom will change our life for the better. His desire is for us to find wisdom through patience in life. So today, will you follow his path for your life?